And a reminder, um, a reminder for people who are attending in person is that we do need to make sure and maintain quiet throughout the room. Even if we whisper to each other, Zoom tends to pick that up and it tends to interfere. So, and we have tonight um, people attending in person with us at the U of A. We have people on Zoom and we have people on Facebook. We're delighted to have all of you here um, for our first Friday of the month meeting. We're here every first Friday of the month at 630 and we welcome everyone to, you know, to come on a regular basis if possible. I'm May Smith, I'm the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association President. And tonight, helping us with technology, we have Jim Knoll and Terry Lappin, and then Cheryl Knoll is going to be operating our camera for us. Um, we, uh, we will um, have a question period. We will hold questions to the end unless somebody um, does not understand something that was just said or, or something on the slide is not clear, then, you know, please enter your questions, your comments in the chat about that. And we'll try to take care of those things at the time. Um, otherwise, we'll hold questions to the end. And um, today we have um, a great guest speaker for us. And um, he specializes in and a lot of different things, but he's going to talk to us tonight about the giant uh, lens. And um, he works in Tucson. Um, he is from originally from Rochester and um, has had a lot of, of really great kind of research and, and non-research astronomy experiences. So and I'm not, not sure what happened with our duplicate sound there, but I think we'll be okay for the rest of the night. Um, so we have Max Lippitz, who's going to start. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the history of a giant lens. Just a quick about me. My name is Max Lippitz. Uh, I graduated with a Bachelor of Science from the Rochester Institute of Technology and Imaging Science last year, class 22. Um, as a result of that and my, uh, you know, general obsession with photography beforehand, I am a scholar of strange and unusual optics. And uh, just in January, I moved to Tucson, uh, here in Tucson, where I work at GEOS, uh, developing space and ground-borne imaging technology for national defense. I actually spent most of the afternoon in the clean room. <laughs> um, so, have you ever seen this before? Hint, it can be used for photography. It can be strapped to a plane. This is a giant lens located on the third floor of the northwest corner of the Rochester Institute of Technology Center for Imaging Science, also known as where I basically lived for five years. <laughs> so I, like many of you, have these tchotchke that, you know, you walk through your halls of school and, you know, you see these and you go like, oh, they won a trophy in 1998 for soccer. So that's basically what this is. And during orientation, I walked by and I'm like, what is this? And I looked on the side and you can see the assumption. It's a 48 inch F6.3 built by Eastman Kodak, which makes sense considering it's in Rochester, New York. Uh, it was designed for aerial reconnaissance imaging. 48 inches tall. If you take a tape measure to it and measure the lens diameter, it's seven and a half inches. Uh, it's got a nine by 18 inch imaging plane. Keep in mind your phones measure their imaging planes in millimeters or submillimeters. Uh, it's got built in red and yellow filters. It weighs about 200 pounds, and its serial number is EK80630. So, what was it thought to be for? Well, I asked, and the Dragon Lady, the U2 spy plane, built by Clarence Kelly Johnson. You may remember him from such aircraft as the F 104 Starfighter and the SR 71 Blackbird. It's got an 80,000 foot ceiling. And uh, it still flies to this day. Most recently, got some pretty cool photos of that, uh, ironically, spy balloon. <laughs> um, so that's what they told me it was for. And I then Googled a little bit more. And I was like, OK, it's called a Kodak Aereo Ektar. End of story. And then there was COVID. So I started researching. So here's just a bit on the history of aerial reconnaissance. So in 1794, during the War of the First Coalition at the Battle of Fleurus, the French 
had a hot air balloon and they used it for reconnaissance. You jump about a hundred ish years, you have Julius Newberg's invention of the pigeon camera. Look up the photos, it works better than you'd think. Um, World War I, we got leaps and bounds in the imaging, in imaging technology, and we inevitably got about a half a million photos after the end of the First World War, including stereopsis, which allows us to use two cameras to judge the height of the terrain quite well. And then by the end of World War II, we had lenses that could see for miles. But that is hardly the whole story. So the year is 1941. <laughs> America prepares. All America alters its pattern of life and work to meet the demand for protection. Industry is a double step to supply the sinews of safety, the armaments of war that an embattled world must have if democracy is to survive. And thank God it did. So, this is your basic World War II reconnaissance camera setup. It contains two parts, much unlike this camera right here. You've got your lens, or as they call it, a lens cone, because it was cone-shaped at the time. And you've got your film spool, or in this case, camera. And you put the two together, they were interchangeable, and they did, you know, whatever. Most common kind at the time was a K-22. And uh, at the time, the shutter could be, of course, in the, in the, either in the imaging system or in the lens. Uh, this particular camera, our particular RI2 lens, doesn't have a lens in it. Of course, this is not a camera. This is a Optimus Prime Transformer. Comes from the can, if you remember. Um, so these are the K22 Fairchild, and you can see we have the ubiquity of just the lenses that they had available generally at the time, from six to 40 inches up, with uh, general uh, statistics on their um, what kind of shutters they had. And but this. It is not about those lenses, it's about a giant lens, one that they didn't really list. So, in April 1942, Ethan Kodak was requested to manufacture a 48 inch F6.3 lens, which they agreed to do. And the first generation of this lens was manufactured between 1942 and 1944, designed by George Acklin at the Kodak Hawkeye facility. If you're not familiar with Hawkeye, it is a legendary facility, not because of the Hawkeye Brownie, although, yes, that is from there, it's because Hawkeye facility developed spy satellite film in the night in the Cold War. So basically, you take your spy satellite, you put your film in a return canister, you shoot it down to Earth, and then it parachutes down, and then a plane comes by and picks it up while it's parachuting down. It sounds convoluted. It's from Batman, but it worked. Um, it, the estimated R&D cost was about $256,000, or about $4.9 million a day. $5,000 uh, manufacturing cost, uh, about $96,000 today. And uh, yeah, this is a chart showing uh, basic uh, altitude to cost of particular lenses with uh, R&D uh, highlighted particular interest. Um, this, the lens serial number EE0002 was received for testing in June 1st, 1944 at the Army Air Force Photographic Laboratory Engineering Division, Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. This, there it was tested by Mr. Edward B. Woodford, and he made some conclusions and some recommendations about it. And this is the data he got from that lens. And as you can see here at the half, ang half angle exposures, basically the obliquity of the camera to the ground, along with relative exposure relative to what I'm not sure, um, you get about 49 lines per millimeter in the, um, in the yellow, in the red, and in, and, but not in the infrared. So, Woodford concluded, as I just said, that you get 49 lines per millimeter and a minimum of 24 lines per millimeter using this lens. And that performance was greater, was at par or greater than the 40 inch lenses they were using at the time. He also found that temperature and pressure were enough of a concern that compensation should be added. The higher you go, the thinner the atmosphere gets, colder it gets. And then you slowly choke to death. Um, it was recommended that 13 more lenses be produced for extended service testing and be mounted in the K22 camera and that temperature and pressure be added. So this RIT lens seems to be a resulting of those uh, report of, the, of that recommendation. It's got built-in pistons for pressure compensation. It's got a heater for temperature compensation. 
and it seems to be the 89th to roll off the assembly line, hence the AF50 assay number, AF5089 assay number. So uh, with the Beacon Hill report, which uh, said it was about 200 being manufactured at the around that time in 1952, uh, that puts our estimated manufacturing date between 1945 and 1952. Uh, the temperature and pressure systems were developed by one Mr. Charles M. Lee, and while not Woodford didn't recommend putting a filter wheel in the camera, there is one in the camera with red, clear, and yellow filter. Um, most likely the reason they put that in there is because it made it a lot more simple to turn lenses to, you know, you didn't have to have multiple cameras for multiple filters and also the filters weighed 12 pounds, so you don't have to lug that around. So let's get technical, folks. We have at the very top the lens cap, we have the three knob, the filter change knob, the focus adjustment knob, and the aperture adjustment knob. Uh, the, at the bottom, there is attachment bolts for connecting it to a film magazine, as well as separation between the lens's top and bottom section. The top section weighs about 125 pounds, the bottom section weighs about 75 pounds. Um, the warning, sudden changes of four degrees or more may cause severe damage to this lens. The lens must be covered before so the, so a sudden change occurs and must remain covered for one hour following. Basically, that means that they hadn't invented low expansion glass yet. So much like if you put uh, hot water in a cold Pyrex and it explodes, um, basically the same thing except the giant lens. Um, the handles made it easy movement. I've never found it easy to move it. And this, I believe, is from 19, image of it from 1947. And I believe this is what it looks like dismantled, I think. I'm not sure, but I'm going to assume it is because it's got the same shape, same thing. On the bottom, it says 48 inch F6.3 Eastern Kodak telephoto lens. So we know the lens designer, George Acklin, and we know Kodak was one of the most prolific of patineers of their time. It saved them from bankruptcy. So I went searching on Google and found the only five element F6.3 lens that George Acklin built. And this is it. So as you can see, there's pretty big room at F2 for a for what would be probably where the filter wheel is. And this very well may be the patent. I can't confirm for certain. The effective focal length is 100 millimeters, but that's for every single one of Acklin's patents. So it could be that that's just how they did patent stuff. And this is the patent for Charles M. Lee's focus adjustment wheel. And you can see that it looks very similar to a exposure adjustment wheel, except the set the out, you set your altitude, you set your filter, and then you can figure out how to adjust your focus so the ground will be uh, properly seen. And these are other Charles M. Lee patents that I believe may have something to do with it, although I couldn't be certain. And here's just a close up of the focus adjustment knob. And it is very similar to an exposure. The silver knob on the side is a locking. It basically is refining close adjustments. And to lock it, you kind of flip it out and it makes it easier to move. So at the top right, you can see the filter uh, wheel change, clear, red, and yellow. Uh, the bottom, the aperture adjustment that goes from F6.3 to F22. And this is the air inlet for the pneumatic pistons, uh, the pink. Stuff is probably a desiccant of some kind to keep the air dry so it doesn't rust the pistons. And this is where you're about to see the filters move and the aperture move. So it's currently set to red, clear, yellow, red, clear. And then there's the aperture, which is just enormous. These are the, if you turn it on its side, you'll see these are the gears. Uh, I believe they're called bevel gears, and those are for uh, adjusting the focus and aperture. And this is the circuitry, the uh, circuitry contact for the heater system. And uh, it's a very, also a very, very crusty and disintegrating diagram of, of those electrical diagram of the heater. The pneumatic pistons, um, these I was shocked to see because they are blue and they look, they look insanely modern. I doubt they are, I'm sure they were made very long time ago, but they are very clean and very pristine condition. I was very excited to see that. So Kodak built a ginormous lens bigger than anything ever uh, that anyone else had done. So of course they're gonna brag about it, wouldn't you? So in early May, 1945, an AP and United States press uh, wire went out to 52 newspapers across the country. And between May 1st and 7th, a bunch of reports came out, basically old 
cool clickbait saying that Kodak built this lens and it's awesome. The lens and they touted the lens's enormous size, the use of new rare element glass. We'll get to that. The, its ability to resolve objects up to 10 miles, its ability to outperform 40 inch lenses currently in service, and of course, the pressure and temperature compensation system. And this is a few of those articles uh, Giant Lens for Air Force in Rochester. Uh, giant telephoto lens, also in Rochester, New York. But my favorite one was from Boone, Iowa, and it was just simply huge lens. That's it. That's all you need. But the my personal favorite piece of propaganda is in the June 1945 issue of Popular Photography. As you can imagine, Ethan Kodak was huge in the camera world for a very long time, and they probably took out several full color page ads in Kodak, in Popular Photography every month. And this happened to be one of them. So this was a ad that had very, it talked about very similar things, but in a different style. And they called it a big boy. And this is the same one Woodford tested. So if we look closely, EE002. So that is the same lens. And it, they Kodak dolled it up, put it next to a wristwatch for size. And I have no clue where it is now. Wait a minute. You didn't learn how World War II ended. We won! Yeah! USA! 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 So, by the end of World War II, it seems that these lenses were basically not needed. So, it's actually a pretty old story in the military industrial complex. By the time you make it, no one needs it. It's quite sad. Kodak produced them probably because they were either under contract or the Air Force had other plans for them. So uh, also there was a bit of hitch in the plan when Kodak manufactured this lens, there was not a shutter built for it. And no one thought it was, was possible to build it. So yeah. So let's take a brief tangent. Operation Crossroads. The first of many weapons tests at Bikini Alto was in 1946. Uh, Bikini Alto, if you're not familiar, uh, is basically the top section of Bikini Bottom from SpongeBob. Yes, SpongeBob is a radioactive uh, mutant. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Uh, this operation detonated several nuclear blasts and used target ships, about 95 of them, surplus World War II, in order to uh, test how nuclear weapons did. And we learned a lot about that. We also displaced an entire small island nation. So, you know, pros and cons. Um, in total, about 450 surplus World War II cameras were used. And here are the cameras. And just here is, these are just the, them setting up the cameras for that photo, for the photograph you just saw. And it's just an enormous amount of cameras. And the largest among them was that big one there called Big Bertha. And I'll just show you this again. So it was built of a 48 inch lens and a K34 camera modified by one Mr. William Mugel. And he also operated the camera in Bikini Atoll. Uh, Mugel had to design a four and a half inch mechanical louver shutter uh, which was once thought to be impossible, and it was the fastest and largest of that type ever built. And it seems like only one of these were built. And this is it during construction. And other photos during construction are a photo of lovely photo of Big Bertha, as well as the electromechanical diagram for that lens. I found research on I did found a lot of stuff on this uh, Louvre shutter. And here is uh, William Mungo operating it. Uh, it's a bit unusual to see the camera's builder also operating it. Uh, lucky him. Uh, it's also said that he was the smallest amongst the entire camera crew. And I believe there he is, uh, the gentleman in the glasses on the far left. So uh, 50,000 images were taken during Operation Crossroads, and whereabouts of Big Bertha, I have no clue. This is also the only ever instance I can find of a, someone actually using a 48 inch lens and it actually working, or for that matter, ever using it. So, in a 1959 report, the historical explanation from Dology, WS 117L, Discovery Century and UDs, 1946 to 1959, Part B, 
it says, obviously, these lines are already on the verge of putting, being put out to pasture. So by the time these lines were ready to go, nobody wanted them. So the Air Force had a genius idea. Who else uses giant lenses? Observatories, we're in one right now. So they donated a lot of these giant lenses to observatories, thinking that they could use them for turn them into telescopes. The problem is giant lenses do giant wide field lenses for aerial photography don't translate to narrow field of view telescopes for astronomy. And, and it's only been in the last 10, 15 years that wide field of view telescopes have been coming into the public's eye. Check your local listings for the DRC Rubin telescope coming soon to Chile. <laughs> um, the cost of adapting these telescopes would probably also be enormous. They are very heavy, and mirrors, quite frankly, are better. And that's no truer than right here at the University of Arizona. Right underneath the uh, football stadium is the, the mirror lab where some of the largest telescope mirrors in the world are built. So it became a display piece, except for one, a six inch aerial reconnaissance lens was turned into a functioning telescope at the Keeley Observatory, which is in the United Kingdom. And these photos were either from the 80s or 90s, I'm not sure. So this RIT lens probably never saw any action. And if it did, it was still classified. And I should probably file a FOIA for that, but I haven't done that. Uh, the lens uh, somehow found its way to the observatory at J George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. And it was given to the Rochester Institute of Technology sometime in 2011, 2012, and brought up from Virginia to Rochester by Daryl Wilson. It sits on the third floor of the northwest corner of the Imaging Science Building to this day. So are there any other examples of this lens? Well, yes, there are. In a 1961 issue of Cyan Telescopes in their US surplus bargain section, it lists a, match the, it lists a lens matching description, 200 pounds, 48 inch, f6.3, list price of $150 or 1500 bucks a day. If you want to buy one right now, it's listed on eBay, German, sold out of Germany, $5,400, been on and off for 10 years. They've increased the price. It was $2,500 at one point. Um, its Air Force serial number is a 234, so 234 is to roll off the assembly line. And one sold over the summer of 2020 by a Virginia-based huge uh, a government surplus supplier called Surplus Minster. Uh, they were kind enough to give me the town they shipped it to, which was Christiansburg, Ohio. I made many calls to the local businesses, to the post office, asking, do you know of anyone or do you know if anyone's gotten a giant lens in the mail? Uh, they said no, and no one ever wrote me back or called me back. Yeah, is that better? Leo? All right. So. Now you know the story, but there are still a couple of misconceptions and mysteries to clear up. Misconception, was the lens a prototype for the U2? Mystery, the serial number of the lens, and a misconception, the lens is a Kodak Aerial XR. So the U2, let's go back to 1950. So the precipitating report for the U2 was the Beacon Hill report. It's from 1952, it got declassified about 10 years ago. A lot of books were made based on that report. And it basically said that the lenses were in limited production of about 200, limited production in the present tense, which means they were currently being built. It, al it also said that it recommended that 48, the 48 inch lenses be not used in reg regular reconnaissance lenses, but set aside for the special reconnaissance, the U2. So if it ever was a prototype for it, or if it ever did see U2 action, it's still classified as a prototype. But this is the main reason why I thought it was from the U2, the A2 camera. So this was the camera they originally used on the U2, and it's made of a K38 Fairchild lens, uh, camera and a 36-inch lens. And it looked remarkably similar, similar enough that on a quick Google search, you go, oh, yeah, that's it, and then put your phone down. And these lenses, these cameras are currently on display at the Ohio, uh, the Air Force uh, National Museum right now in Ohio. So if you want to go see them, by all means, I haven't. <laughs> Um, so that's probably why it's listed in the people think it's in the U2. So mystery number two, the serial number. The codex serial number is a very well understood nomenclature, a mnemonic of Kamarovsky, uh, with each uh, letter corresponding to a number. So if EE -E is our serial number, camera C A M E 44, so manufactured in 1944. 
EK. I don't know what that is. You can codex, prototype, no kidding. That's about all I can say on that. So, misconception, the name. The lens has been misidentified as a codex area XR lens. Um, they were used very heavily in the large format photography. Uh, they were used very heavily in World War II for AO reconnaissance and found a second life these days as AO reconnaissance lens. They're quite, uh, they're, they're quite popular as a large format, uh, the large format cam, the large format photography community. Sorry, I'm trying to get myself there. Um, there are a few reasons this might be why. Uh, the most likely explanation is George Acklin is also the, was the chief optics designer of the AO XR line. Uh, there's a book called Light written by a man named Alexander Efron. And on page 96, he briefly talks about and has a diagram, an uh, optical diagram of a Kodak XR 48 inch f6.3 tall photo lens used for aerial photography. The German eBay listing does misidentify it as a huge Kodak area XR lens, 48 inch f6.3. Oh, and it also displays similar radioactive properties as the area XR lens. Yes. So, back in the day, lens technology and also the idea that humans would live long were not in the chief focus of the public mind. So, in order to get a higher refractive index, the fifth element of this lens was uh, introduced uh, thorium, between 12 and 20 percent, uh, can't be sure. And thorium is radioactive. It's, I think, element 68 on the periodic table. Back check me, please. Um, 90? Okay, thank you, 90. <laughs> um, and it will, in its uh, thorium oxide state inside a lens, emit alpha and beta, which then uh, da have daughter decays in the X-ray and gamma due to excitation. Um, yeah. So uh, I did, when I found out about this, I did some, got a Geiger count, I did some fairly intense measurements. And I found that if it was sitting directly on your chest, a 200 pound lens sitting directly on your chest, you'd get about 130 millisieverts an ounce, um, sorry, microsieverts an ounce, which if you get a chest X-ray is 100 microsieverts all in one go. So you'd basically be doing a reenact, so you'd, you'd be safe. You wouldn't be happy because you'd be doing a reenactment of the crucible with yourself playing with Jalad Curley going, more away, but you'd be relatively safe. Uh, the metal clone also provides uh, excellent radiation shielding. And these are just uh, very um, uh, uh, measurements I took of the lens. So uh, it only, even the radiation only really starts to tick up once you get within two feet of it. Otherwise, it's relatively harmless. So the lens also, and this is very common of many lenses of the era, experiences a phenomenon known as radiation burn, where as uh, the radiation, is, the particles hit the material, electrons are knocked off and cause induced f centers, which discolors the lens this very ugly shade of brown. Um, there are a couple of ways you can uh, fix this. Uh, the main one is thermal annealing, where you put it in an oven and bring it up to thermal annealing temperature, and then bring it back down, and it loosens up the electrons, put them back where they're supposed to go, and then the color is all cleared up. Oh, really? Um, the uh, where was it? Uh, the other one, which I've only seen anecdotally, I never found any real evidence to support it, is uh, UV light exposure. The large format photography community finds that UV light, you leave that in the sun, you put it in front of a gecko lamp, it anneals the stuff and turns it in, makes it work again. And that was got a bit heavy. So let's take a word from one of our sponsors. I'm Marilyn Monroe. And when I get blue, I reach for a box of asbestos. Mm, asbestos. It's as best as can be. We all know asbestos. We all love asbestos. And I have searched far and wide for the schematics for this lens. I have failed on every account, but I did find two lenses of comparable tech to it. Uh, both of them have pressure and temperature compensation systems, and 
because they have temperature compensation, they're gonna need insulation. You can see right here, insulation, asbestos felt. This is a 40 inch F5.6 developed by Harvard College right around the same time. And this is another lens also developed by Harvard College, a 60 inch F5 um, with an eighth inch layer of asbestos. So yeah. So your office paperweight is effectively hazardous weight. Now what? Nothing. The shell has spoken. But I am not one to leave a sleeping bear lie. So there are two things I tried and one thing I did. I tried to pick the radiation browning. I tried to turn it into a ginormous view camera. And I did make a lovely display card. So I spent about a month exposing this thing to $50 worth of Amazon UV light sources with no appreciable effect on the UV source. I'm assuming that 70 years of constant radiation bombardment with no other UV source has knocked it into a pretty good well and set state. Um, that being said, I also didn't want to try and dismantle it and turn it into a, uh, a thermal anneal it because that's going to be a very conciliatory call to the fire department and the EPA and the Department of Energy. So I didn't want to do that. So I tried and failed at that. And then I tried to make it into a giant view camera. This was my idea, set it up on a big fork mount, have it kind of move around in a cradle. And if the propaganda could be believed on the third floor of the Center for Imaging Science, you can, on a clear day, you can actually see the skyline of Rochester from a distance and you would be, might be able to even see into the buildings. And my thought process was in order to not get sued for irradiating people, I'd wrap it in lead to add more weight to it and have the rear have plywood panels also caked in lead and use magnets to hold it shut. With ground glass in the back, obviously. So this is what I did do. On a rainy day, I went to the mechanical engineering department, asked to borrow their largest engine hoist, and a bunch of lift straps. I hauled it all over, and then I attached it to the back. I attached it. I strapped it up to the uh, to the lens and saw what I could do. I also got, took some framing glass with some silicone carbide, ground it down, and made a bracket to hold it so it was effectively a view camera. And this is what I got out of it. And it's honestly not half bad. It, you know, you wouldn't want to you know use it all day mainly because it's utterly terrifying to have that much weight suspended from a hook like that, but it worked. But I didn't keep it like that because it looked ridiculous. So I just ended up leaving exactly where it was and left this, a framed up version of the big boy Kodak, uh, Kodak, uh, Kodak ad and a historical treatise, which is effectively this presentation I just gave. And that is a convoluted meandering history story about a giant radioactive lens. I thank you for your curiosity. And are there any questions? Yes, sir. Was, were there any astronomical photographs uh, that you know of ever taken with that lens? Uh, no, although I did consider, one of the things I considered for my senior project was trying to turn the 48-inch lens into a uh, astronomy camera. I didn't. Uh, you know, the 9 by 9 Oh, the Keeley, uh, not that I could see it. There was only those three photos and a couple of other scraps of information was all I could find. Could have probably used an eight by 10 sheet film that would have yield, yielded some spectacular Milky Way shots. Probably, although if there is, if those exist, those are probably an ocean away, unfortunately. Um, were we going to alternate questions? Yeah, with there, uh, okay. No, okay. Wow, I'm really impressed. This is awesome. The, the, the historical work to pull up all those details and your experimental work, you don't see things like that anymore. 
And this whole topic is just perfect for people like us. I, I'm really mega impressed. Well done. It's called being, it's called COVID. It gives you a lot of time to do stuff you wouldn't expect. <laughs> okay, so here, here's, a, here's a random technical yeah. question. Okay, you stick that thing up at a U2 altitude. Yeah. And you take a picture of a Soviet car or whatever, and can you read the license plate or or what, what is the re resolution for that camera at U two altitudes? I honestly would have to do the math on it. it could, could you make a guess? Oh, I would guess. I'm going to do this in uh, pixels per uh, pixels per meter because that's what my brain does. Is what I was trained in the era of digital. I would guess it probably have to be around a hundred. Uh, meters per pixel, uh, maybe 10 meters per pixel. It did, it to, in, on the chart uh, about the lens, it was only really, it was not only really designed to go up to 20,000 feet, uh, but I'd say maybe 20, 30 meters per pixel. Okay, so you aren't reading license plates. No. Okay, wow, thank you very much for an excellent yeah, talk. Well. One of the best. You did have a comment on the screen too. Do you want to read that? I can't see my screen. Yeah, so Dean on uh, Facebook just made a comment. He said, FYI, there used to be a six inch lens, perhaps F80 astrograph run by Stewart Observatory up on Tumamock Hill. It was removed for its own safety when the enclosure was no longer waterproof, but I believe it was of Japanese design, perhaps a war prize, and I also believe it was a triplet. There's, that. Um, there's another, while I've got it, I'll go ahead and just do another one from uh, Don Kane. Very interesting topic, thank you. There must be millions of Cold War antiques out there with the story and with the potential of being repurposed. Where did you get the film for your test shots? Um, for, you mean back in the day? No, for the, Im the images that you shot during your experiment. Um, what do you mean film? I what, didn't use any film. So what did you use to capture the images with the, with the lens? Oh, ground glass. Um, so this uh, is effectively, uh, so you take, you go on the internet on Amazon, you buy an eight and a half by 11 uh, piece of glass for, uh, for a frame, you get some silicon carbide, you wet that, and you take two pieces of glass, you rub them together in between those two glasses, and it grinds it down, and it, the light then basically uh, diffuses onto the glass and forms an image. So it's a very, very old technique. It's been around since photography and probably longer than the chemistry of camera and film. Perfect. Thanks. So having owned a few radioactive thorium eyepieces, there's one source of heat and UV light that you missed out on, really? the sun. I, consider, I did consider the sun. If you, uh, put a, it has, if you put the thorium lenses out in the sun for uh, you know, a whole day at a time, a few, for a few days, it'll get it because the sunlight will actually bounce, will bounce around inside of there and um, Depending on the positioning of the elements, it's usually not a problem for anything catching on fire or anything like that. Just, but you just put it, I just put it vertical. I didn't dismantle anything, but I've, I've done like three thorium eyepieces and it worked. It, it isn't perfect, but it, you know, it makes it enough that you can look through it to the extent that you'd want to look through a thorium eyepiece. Um, it, they actually did report with the thorium eyepieces and tank guns that the, um, cataract rate of the tank operators was like three or four times the average yeah, military officer. Yeah, it's the only so thing thumbs up on that one. Um, bad idea. Yes, that's um, very bad idea. Yeah, uh, I, I remember being at Stellafane when John Briggs showed the something like a 48 inch lens and he, no, 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 no. He merely laid it out on a table for all the Stellafaners to, to look. 
and a little before noon, it cracked. Yeah. 40, 40. And that, that, that's been long a, 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 a watershed event for people of, boy, John was stupid. But if the choice is between having a brown lens that doesn't work, well, yeah, but if you want, if you're willing to take the risk, it does work probably better for smaller optics, though. Yeah. Do not look through thorium eyepieces. Uh, Ethan Kodak, uh, the Ethan Museum uh, in Rochester, they found out uh, they had a box of these thorium lenses, and it cost them probably their way to loss. So beware. So if you want to have, you know, the large. Yep. We'll come back and get your comment, and then we'll do someone else. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of optical stuff that's radioactive. I have radioactive barnazite, which has a vanadium oxide. It won't kill you to use it to polish stuff. So, just be careful. I just want to mention that I went to see Asteroid City last night at 10:15. So everybody who hasn't seen it, I would highly recommend Asteroid City. It's only going to be there a couple more days next Thursday. So my question was I grew up in that world you know in the 50s yeah. so I could relate to the cameras the old cameras so he uses a Kodak um before Kodachrome he's a photographer in Asteroid City and it's all the old stuff like what you're doing here kind of thing yeah. and he has all the threads of all these different um brainiac kids getting awards it's just so tied into what we're talking about but it's the old old stuff from the 50s so you, you'd learn a lot I did. I I work in things keeping me very busy, so I haven't been able to see Asteroid City yet. It is very much on my list. Okay, we have another question uh, down further. Did you have one on? Okay. Um, you're referring to it as a 40 inch lens, 48. 48 inch lens. That's the focal length, correct? Yes. Not the diameter. The diameter is a seven and a half. Seven and a half. Okay. Okay. On Zoom, uh, Matthias asks, uh, you mentioned the operation crossroads use of a huge number of cameras. I'm wondering if you ran across any applications these lenses these lenses in an underwater aquatic environment joined about 10 minutes late apologies if you covered it. Uh, no, I did not and I honestly did not look into that because aquatic optics are a bit different um, when you have a lens in an aquatic environment. It, uh, at the very least, at the very minimum, you may have to change, uh, change the focus because you're going, instead of going from a refractive index of one, you're going into a refractive index of uh, 1.3 in, uh, directly into the lens. Of course, this could probably be fixed up with uh, a small layer of air in between the uh, uh, lens and the water. Uh, but uh, these lenses also, you know, they had a very, very specific purpose. So I, Imagine someone uh, in the Cold War saying, we got a bunch of extra of these lenses. Let's see if we can use them on a submarine. But I haven't found that use yet, or that case study yet. So the answer is no. Sorry. OK, we're sometimes having intermittent mic problems still and trying to. Yeah. Every once in a while, figure out what the solution is. I've just to comment uh, uh, the, the lens would have a resolution of about three arc seconds per pixel. So obviously, you know, 49 lines uh, per millimeter or something like that. 
So that's quite impressive for a, a wide field camera. Yeah. And and if you had fly at commercial uh, airplane at 10 kilometer altitude, you get a resolution of about 15 centimeters. So it's not enough to read the letters of a license plate, but it, it's still pretty good resolution. Thank you for doing the math. Appreciate it. Okay, do we have other questions, comments? Anything else on, on Zoom or Facebook? Okay, so I think we're through with our questions for the evening. Thank you so much, Max. We appreciate this. It was really an interesting talk. I'm sorry, sometimes we had our microphone. One of the microphones apparently sometimes was going in and out and it was kind of hard to know what was causing that or what to do about that. So, um, so we're sorry for the inconvenience that people had with that. <clears throat> so um, I, I think at, um, at this point, we're going to say thank you to our people who are attending on Facebook and we appreciate your coming. We hope that you will visit our website at tucsonastronomy.org. And, um, and we hope that you'll look at our webpage. And there's a lot of information there, both about our activities and also some basic astronomy information. And there are some activities for children and just a variety of different things on the website. So we hope you'll look at that. And we hope you, you will come back another time and visit with us. So good night to our Facebook people.